Thanks, Sam. Oh, my goodness, I am so incredibly grateful and enlightened. And, and frankly, I just love and will probably be thinking for the next couple of weeks on some of the articulations of these issues by those students. I think some of the hardest things around any of these issues and a big thread in all of that is how do we even how do we even describe what these experiences are and how we're you know interfacing with them and those articulations across the board are just amazing. Oh, thank you. Let's turn our eyes a little bit to uh, to two guests that are going to join us for about the next hour, Ada Paris and Marcus Anderson. Uh, they both have joined us here on the Zoom, and we are going to watch a video that they've recorded. Hello, Ada. Welcome, welcome, Wakanda forever. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I thought I'd do the camouflage version. I love it. <laughs> and Marcus, I think, is with us too. Yes, he's there. He's on yeah. screen as well. Yeah, I'm oh, here. oh, good, good, good. Okay, this is an interface. Too many screens. I've got a war room set up so I can see all the slacks and all the slack uh, chats. And hey, Marcus. Hey, Donna. So, um, you guys have recorded for us, but while we're watching your conversation, we'll also have you in the chat. So we've got you in both an asynchronous and synchronous modality together, and that's like having two of you at the same time. I love it. Doppelgangers. Yes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ada Paris, and this is my co-founder, Marcus Anderson. Marcus and I are super excited for this session, focusing on digital trust. And we want to say a big thank you to Donna Kidwell and the ASU technology team for being so bold as to have these necessary conversations. As a little background to who we are, Marcus and I are co-founders in a new company called ISM.Earth which builds projects, companies, uh, frameworks, and offerings at the nexus of ancient wisdom, modern technology, and future societies. When approached to be part of these conversations that surface around digital trust, the question that came up for us was how might we approach individual and collective sovereignty in the 21st century? As we develop and unfold solutions that we focus on, we approach and conceptualize our offerings by activating the ability to revisit the past, acknowledge the present, and co-design the future. The world is undergoing a global evolution which is integrating developments in biology, materials and information technologies at an accelerating pace. Therefore, the future of how humans relate to and intertwine with technology and machines is being defined at this very moment. We're still in the midst of a global pandemic that has touched everyone in the world, directly or indirectly. This is not the first pandemic and it certainly won't be the last global crisis, but there are some lessons that can be learned from how our relationship with digital and algorithmic technologies has shifted our relationship with ourselves, others and our environment. During this time, there has been an acute realization that we're all connected and share a place and part within the natural world. At the same time, technology has also helped us to survive, to connect, to share, to think, and prepare for what is possible once we emerge from this liminal space. Marcus, over to you. Thank you, Ada, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I love working with you. Uh, you know, during this transition, many fundamental as well as ethical questions continue to arise, like how society should seek to shape evolution and governance around technological innovation. And what are the borders and boundaries between humans and machines? Now, these considerations are a work in progress and need to be approached, processed, and researched further. You know, companies, institutions, as well as participants will need to have a clear understanding of the ramifications around these integrations, where it's not all about innovation, but also included in the conceptual conversation is the ability to not forget or neglect the unintended consequences which may arise. Now, when we speak of digital trust, we must consider ancestral context, diversity, data governance, as well as privacy, human capital, and the need for equal representation around STEAM talent, fake news, as well as deep fakes within AI, global governance, and the ability to take risks and investments for the future. Now, as we move through this session, we are going to consider five elements which we feel can lead to a holistic consideration of what do we need to leave behind to create a value statement? How do we breathe in a new way of understanding and approach a hypothesis for change from old models to new models around digital trust? 
how might we grow and what tools, technologies, models, as well as potential MVPs can be produced? How do we find our flow around these topics to integrate new rituals, habits, and behaviors? Lastly, how might we ground this knowledge and activate digital trust into society with deep thought, consideration, as well as empathy? Now, as we dive into this session, we want to start off with a quote to set the stage. This one happens to come from David Bone, which says, the ability to perceive or think differently is more important than the knowledge gained. And this is what we will attempt to do in this session. We want to think differently and push ourselves beyond our edges to imagine what is possible for the future. And with that, I would love to pass the conversation back over to my co-founder and confidant out of Paris to help us approach the question, how might we shift from a more historical institutional model approach to new integrated self-determining models that support a regenerative future. Ada. Thank you, Marcus. I love working with you and I love these types of conversations that we have. They're so thought expanding. Um, well, let's kick off. There's nothing like starting at the deep end, right? Uh, with such a big question. So Marcus, you've asked, how might we shift from historical institutional models to new integrated self-determining models that support a regenerative future? And my first thought is what do we mean by historical institutional models? And what are some of the ones that we need to leave behind? So you've just mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's start there or here is where we're at. It's forcing many of us all over the world, but especially in the more financially and economically rich global North to examine our perception of our current realities and therefore understand the impact of our historical institutional models, our governing isms as such, such as nationalism, capitalism, patriarchism, digital feudalism, academicism, ageism, etc. We are increasingly aware that the foundations that build many of our histories, many of our societies that we use to try and predict and design our futures were falsehoods and in many cases systemically and institutionally unjust. Our personal, professional and business North Stars have disappeared from view. And that leaves us all in a state of flux. And for some, that's also trauma because who do you now trust and how do you begin to build and maintain trust in a constant state of flux? Coincidentally, we've also been witnessing an exponential rise or resurgence in interest in philosophies and practices such as new ageism, Enthogenic studies, which you know is psychoactive, substances often psychedelic, and as you mentioned, Marcus, ancient wisdom and technologies, and quantum consciousness. Many with algorithmic and digital technology playing a significant role in the speed of adoption and commodification of these rise. There seems to be a shift back towards ancestral knowledge and wisdom and intelligence, and we hear, see, and speak the language of indigeneity, regenerance, and decolonization. But the question we ask, we're asking is who is leading the narrative and for whose benefit? So Paul Jones is a professor of information science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he says, whilst the internet was built from the beginning to be open and accessible, extensible, it relies on communities of trust. As we are seeing, this reliance is some strong downsides, pishing, fake news, over customization, tribalism for starters. Adding systems of trust, beginning with the promises of blockchain, will and must already address this failing. Will the next internet strengthen the positive, uh, positives of individualism, of equality and of cooperation, or will we become no more than Morlocks and Eli? And for those who don't know that they are characters from H.G. Wells' book, The Time Machine. Paul, uh, Paul Jones says, I remain optimistic as we address not only the engineering challenges, but also the human and social challenges arising. All tools, including media, are extensions of man, of human. We, are, we shape our tools and thereafter our, shape, our tools shape us, says Canadian philosopher Marshall McLuhan. So if we shape our tools and they shape us, when and where do we have the conversation about human rights and measures of personhood? In this hyper-connected, always-on digital world, our sense of self becomes inextricably linked to our concepts of citizenship, of power and responsibility. Sabello Malami, in their paper, From Rationality to Relationality, Ubuntu as an Ethical 
ethical and human rights framework for artificial intelligence governance writes, what is the measure of personhood and what does it mean for machines to exhibit human-like qualities and abilities? Furthermore, what are some of the what are the human rights, economic, social, and political implications of using such machines that are designed to reproduce human behavior and decision making? The question of personhood is one of the most fundamental questions in philosophy, and it is at the core of the questions and the quest for an artificial or mechanical personhood. So we can't talk about citizenship and personhood without talking about culture. And what is culture? For us, it's the sum of the collective knowledge, wisdom, lived experiences, voices, identities, and stories of the individuals within that, that, that ecosystem. It should be fluid like water and have an ability to take on new forms as necessary. We are nothing if not adaptable and resilient. And this pandemic has shown us this. So how can we use some of this resilience as proactive members of cultures to build trust and sovereignty? How can some of the lessons that we have learned during this pandemic help us to shift our understanding of the idea of societal norms? Well, we, Marcus and I, believe that technology can come into play here, not as the solution, but as tools of enlightenment and transformation. But they are just that, they are tools. And we're not just talking about algorithmic technologies either but biological, metaphysical, spiritual, et cetera, because they are all part of who we are and cannot nor should they be separated out from us. And so when it comes to technology, we need to leave or at least be mindful of our tendency, tendency to anthropomorphize technology, creating this kind of it and us divide and negating our responsibilities to ourselves and to our other fellow humans, citizens and kin to all living beings. And to do this, we need to create new hypotheses for change because our old wants, needs and desires are no longer serving us, if they ever did. So Marcus, I'd love you for you to expand on this idea. Thank you, Ada, that was brilliant. Um, just the way that you framed that, you know, and then the explanation concerning the ability for technology be to be a tool, right? To highlight our personhood and really create new cultures of trust, security and care, especially in the digital age. You know, also beginning to leave behind this old notion that we as humans are somehow different or separated from technology. I think that's such an important point. You know, and as a cyborg anthropologist and you as a cyborg shaman, we ask ourselves continuously, what does a boundless world between humans and machines really look like? As we move into our section of breathe and in the context of digital trust and what sovereignty looks like in the 21st century, we wanna be able to generate a hypothesis for change, right? We wanna know how we can actually change the, from the old models to thinking in a new way. And so for the past nine years, I've researched many great minds and thought leaders in the field of science and technology studies. This course that approaches the concept that there are no boundaries between man and machine. Or taking a step for, further, there are no boundaries between animated and inanimated objects. And the conversation of digital trust, whether that be digital AI agents that are, uh, you know, with us from birth or even brain computer interfaces that allow us to learn and process as a machine would. The consistent mass adoption of interconnections between humans and machine really provide the ability to create a discourse around dissolving those perceived boundaries between the two entities. You know, one of my first introductions to cyborg anthropology was initiated by a woman by the name of Karen Barad, who has created discourse around interconnections rather than interconnections. Now, this concept she has coined as new materialism, and this is where intraaction understands agency as not an inherent property of an individual or human to be exercised, but as a dynamism of forces in which all designated things are constantly exchanging and diffracting, influencing and working inseparably. Now, interaction also acknowledges the impossibility of an absolute separation or classically understood objectivity in which an apparatus, really a technology or medium used to measure a property or a person using an apparatus are not considered to be part of the process that allows for specifically located outcomes or measurement. So those things are really bound together uh, in the process as well as their objectivity. Now with that understanding that we are not separated from science and technology, 
but instead interwoven within the phenomenon. Really, how might we imagine technology as a tool for the betterment of society? And I think that's what we really want to get to. Now, we can approach this understanding by probing the potentials that will promote and empower a regenerative future. And I think with a particular focus on risks, benefits, as well as the opportunities that science and technology may pose towards peace, security, community, democracy, environmental sustainability, and human values. Now, when we speak about regenerative futures, this train of action goes way beyond sustainability and innovation, but truly challenges the status quo while leaving room for the hard questions that may not be discovered at the time of present inquiry or research. Now, through this lens, we want to know not only what affects the present, but also what is the change that will affect generations to come. You know, when envisioning the future, the goal should be to create spaces, models, and technologies that allow us to reimagine community, citizenship, and kinship through a system of practices. Therefore, the goal to shift our perspective from seeing the world as a machine to engaging with it as a living network or living organism is really what we're trying to embed in. So this is accomplished through recognizing patterns and with a deep ecological lens that create the frameworks, exchange best practices, and really customize winning value models that map the same functionality as living systems. You know, one of my good uh, mentors as well as friends, Fritoff Capra explains, we are discovering that we cannot understand the major problems of our time in isolation. They are systemic problems. They are by nature interconnected and interdependent and that living organisms are best understood as integrated wholes. And then also the, you know, psychology like Gestalt psychology and the new science of ecology takes that idea even a step further and suggests that perhaps the most dramatic effects in quantum physics would show that at the subatomic level, there are no parts at all that what we call a part is merely a pattern in an inseparable web of relationships. So as we try to define an hypothesis for change in the era of digital trust, we really must discuss the relationships between the digital and the human as inseparable and must not build from the notion that the system to be created is separate from the subject that will be utilizing the tool. And in order to approach this interconnected phenomenon, we need a synthesis of two approaches that have been in competition since the dawn of day and since the dawn of scientific thought. So the study of pattern or form, order and quality and the study of structure, this is where substance, matter and quantity. When these two approaches are combined with the central insight of living systems theory, that of ceaseless, ceaseless flux of matter it really offers a radically new way of conceiving reality. So for the future of digital trust, we must do the same. In this new approach, we must overcome two conceptual problems that have plagued science for centuries. First, the interdependence of pattern and structure overcomes the traditional division between the organic and the inorganic, between the living and the non-living. And second, the interdependence of process and structure overcomes the Cartesian split between mind and matter. So through this, we will assist in shifting our connection to living systems and machines, harnessing the ability to make a transition from the egocentric to the ecocentric values that raise collective awareness of ourselves, one another, future technologies, as well as the planet. So to continue this thread, Ada, I'd love for you to speak a bit about, you know, a way in which we can start to bridge that divide between the organic and inorganic in relation to technologies. Thank you, Marcus. So much woven in there. I did say at the beginning, this is a big question. So I love that, you know, you talked about the intentionality of, the, of technologies and living systems and all of these ideas in relation to world building. So I tend, I have various job titles and one of them is futurist. And having the title of a futurist is a really interesting reality because people expect you to be able to have some sort of crystal ball or to be able to read the stars or to be able to predict the future. None of us can do that. However, we, Marcus agrees with me, we, we think it provides us with an opportunity to world build by le leaning into the role of, the spe of speculative designers and asking some thought-provoking questions and seemingly existential questions through revisiting the past, witnessing the present and co-designing the future. 
So system thinker Buckminster Fuller famously said, you can never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And as we have already discussed, in order to create new models and hypotheses for change, we need to leave the old ways, the old models behind. Now, Marcus introduced you to the concept of systems thinking and extended that to living systems. And the definition of that is that they are open self-organizing life systems, life forms that interact with their environment. So we mustn't forget that we, individuals, communities, education establishments, building businesses, etc., are also those open self-organizing life forms that interact with our environment and all of their tools technologies and all of the rituals and associated behaviors that come with being human desiring sovereignty so if we're really to explore this concept of digital sovereignty then we need to have some shared understanding of what that actually means although recognizing that our lived experiences also contextualize our language so there will never be one fully agreed definition of any word and herein lies the gap between the perception and reality between what is valued and what isn't, between who is valued and who isn't, and between which technologies are deemed superior in helping us to achieve our desired goals and ultimately influencing the who, what, where, when, how, and why of trust. We need to take a systemic approach to building new models. And that means recognizing that every voice, every knowledge system, every lived experience and technology is equal, different, but equal. And it is through creating the containers and conditions for that to be realized and experienced in both the on and the offline world is where we need to start. To build trust and digital sovereignty, we need to understand the difference between equity and equality. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates exact resources and opportunities needed to, e to reach an equal outcome. Equality means that each individual or group of people is given the same resources and opportunities. The same could be applied to our perception and interaction with various technologies, and hence our approach to building trust and sovereignty into our operating systems. And I also mean our human operating systems, the way that we interact with each other. So cyborg shamanism is our framework. It's an example of this in practice. So before meeting Marcus, I spent eight years pattern recognizing, and Marcus mentioned that pattern recognition is part of this spotting and often seeking the inter and intra connections between seemingly opposing worlds, the worlds of digital algorithmic technologies and spirituality. Now, this might sound strange, but bear with me. We all use technology to do three things, to connect with ourselves, to connect with others, and to connect with our environment. This is increasingly the world of the cyborg, the merging of biology and technology. So we use the word cyborg as a deliberate provocation and calls for us to think about what does it mean to be human? What could it mean to be human? The power, the ethics, the responsibilities, the boundaries, and what are we capable of? And we use the word shaman to actively seek out other perspectives, other ways of knowing, because they need to be heard and included if we are really to address the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the Global Goals. If we need, you know, we need to do this successfully whilst building and maintaining cultures and containers and ecosystems of trust and di digital sovereignty. So together, cyborg shamanism is the orientation that brings those multiple worlds together to solve problems. So if we're looking to be the code designers of the future, then how do we grow into these new speculative futures? Well, we need new tools, we need new technologies, new models and minimal viable products to get us there. So I'm now going to hand back to Marcus to continue on this idea. Thanks, Ada. Thank you for that rich, just, I mean, deep understanding, you know, of that connectedness um, and why it's so important that all of those things are integrated. You know, with more access to new and emerging technologies, we are all becoming storytellers. Um, so continue on what you so beautifully codify, we can grow this conversation and really look at a few types of tools, technology, as well as models we currently have access to that help us to realize this digital sovereignty. But before we dive into the tools, I think we would be remiss if we didn't contextualize the role of the designer, who will ultimately be developing and utilizing these tools, technologies, as well as models. 
So design plays an extremely important role in modern industrial societies. Besides this explicit practical functions, design also has implicit social functions. Designers not only create useful products and images, but they also produce and reproduce cultural meanings through those products and images. The social context within which they operate circumscribes the choices designers can make in creating and marketing ideas. Now, only through understanding social and cultural context Hey guys, how many of us are live by a show of hands? All right, hi Ada. I think that our videos crashed. So as the team brings that back up, I might ask folks to take a minute and look at some of this incredible conversation that's happening in the chat. Um, really extraordinary. And, um, and to make a note that we will be putting the videos from the entire sessions, including the Future Port Privacy Forum, um, the extraordinary discussion with our um, students, uh, the, the entire event will be on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to go back and listen to these insights again, you'll have the opportunity to. Thank you all for raising your hands. That's great. Very helpful. There we go. And we're back. So together, cyborg shamanism is the orientation that brings those multiple worlds together to solve problems. So if we're looking to be the code designers of the future, then how do we grow into these new speculative futures? Well, we need new tools. We need new technologies, new models, and minimal viable products to get us there. So I'm now going to hand back to Marcus to continue on this idea. Thanks, Ada. Thank you for that rich, just, I mean, deep understanding, you know, of that connectedness um, and why it's so important that all of those things are integrated. You know, with more access to new and emerging technologies, we are all becoming storytellers. Um, so continue on what you so beautifully codify. We can grow this conversation and really look at a few types of tools, technology, as well as models we currently have access to that help us to realize this digital sovereignty. But before we dive into the tools, I think we would be remiss if we didn't contextualize the role of the designer, who will ultimately be developing and utilizing these tools, technologies, as well as models. So design plays an extremely important role in modern industrial societies. Besides this explicit practical functions, design also has implicit social functions. Designers not only create useful products and images, but they also produce and reproduce cultural meanings through those products and images. The social context within which they operate circumscribes the choices designers can make in creating and marketing ideas. Now, only through understanding social and cultural contexts can designers comprehend fully their role in society. This is such an important point to double down on as the role of any creator comes with the ability and responsibility of impacting and affecting change through telling of stories. 
Now, stories of fluidity or stagnation of our humanity, they're both active, you know, when a designer is actually telling those stories. But gaining and adopting different perspectives on the concept of identity, culture, economics, and ecosystems of freedom through the adoption of individual and collective rituals, this is where I think the role of a designer can really have a significant and impactful role. Now, the designers of the 21st century have a variety of new tools to explore when it comes to the ability to develop for digital sovereignty as well as trust. You know, one of the foundations for these tools is the blockchain or the underlying infrastructure called directed acyclical graphs. And what makes this unique in nature is the functionality of the infrastructure which is constructed in a decentralized way that allows no single person or group having the control of the system. Rather, all participants are validated by the system itself and collectively retain control. Now, this truly is important when we discuss what it means to be sovereign. As we see the rise of products, tokens, and contracts being tied to this technology, which really replaces the legacy centralized power systems and distributed trust throughout the network. So it's a new way of looking at networks and how we actually relate to these networks. So currencies as well as stored value are also in a transition at the moment, which is in the current thoughts and throws of decentralizing currency and also the store of value. As an important distinction, there are two ways to really validate transactions within blockchain systems, all right? We do not have time to go through each and every advantage and disadvantage uh, of these consensus models, but there is proof of work and then there's also proof of stake. Where proof of work requires all of its miners to attempt to solve a complex sum or an equation with the winner of who can solve that equation fastest determined by the person who has the most powerful or quantifiable uh, hardware devices. Where on the other end, the proof of stake model randomly chooses the winner based on the amount they have been staked. So the more skin in the game they have, the more opportunity they have to win. So for many platforms being built nowadays, there was a lean towards proof of stake as there is no centralized mine pool, faster transactions, less energy consumption, and more secure against major attacks. Now, as this technology expands, there will be other consensus models being explored, both with their advantages and I'm sure with their disadvantages. But continuing on some examples of tools that are being considered in the scope of digital sovereignty and trust are the potential for digital avatars driven by artificial intelligence. AI avatars, also known as digital avatars, are human-like bots that are created by AI-powered technology to increase human interaction. While digital avatars don't only have a humanoid appearance, they can also communicate with people with the help of natural language processing algorithms. Now, while constructing an AI avatar, NLP algorithms, image recognition tools, pattern recognition, VR, AR, and 3D animation technologies are used. And after building an AI avatar, it leans and learns from both its developer and end users. So while a digital avatar learns through the algorithms and rules programmed by its developers, it continues to learn through its experience with its human companions. Now in the scope of digital sovereignty, there are companies exploring the feasibility of an AI avatar being designated to a newborn and growing in knowledge as the newborn grows, as well as security and the interaction, right? As that human grows, so does the knowledge and the experiences of that avatar. So this type of technology could be used to store important records and interactions like transcripts and medical records, map goals for human companions, and supply a secure interface with other AI that really kind of provide another layer uh, of this minimal data of an individual that needs to be given to another, say, AI agent or institution in order to make or determine decisions. So as a speculative designer that, you know, Ada and I are, we really envision a trifurcation of three different levels of integration for AI avatars, whether it be space flight, propulsion, mining, manufacturing, even the beginning of megacities. 
right? We see AI proliferation also in the quantum computing. And as a result, the applications will have a lot more seamless integration into our everyday lives. This is including health, longevity, agriculture, and even transportation. You know, we also see AI creating AR and VR worlds and multiple layers of reality within the metaverse, along with overlays on the natural world. And many companies are working in that space as we speak. And people will be able to curate their own lives and increase the tactile relationship they have with their senses. So really expansion and exploration and experience in these days are gonna be integrated in a new way. And that's happening right now. And these are just a few of the tools. I mean, there's a gamut of tools that we have to play with and we can dive deeper maybe in the Q&A, but that has the capability to really create this digital sovereignty in which we're speaking as for the individual as well as the collective. And at the same time, if this is the new landscape in which we find ourselves, we also must ask ourselves, what are the new rules of engagement? This is like a new frontier, it's like the wild, wild west. How do we measure success in this space? And how do we measure flow? I'd love to turn it back over to Ada to kind of you know dig a little bit deeper into some of those questions. Wow, thank you, Marcus. So much to think about there. Um, you know, the great content, great ideas that is taking people on this journey of understanding the systemic approach to this. So when we approach the idea of sovereignty amongst the individual and the collective in the 21st century, we must create a flow that breaks down the silos and hierarchies in order to on-ramp decentralized networks. So we have to change, remember that quote, we have to break the old models to create new ones. This will actively create new rituals, new habits, new behaviors in how we relate to and interact with our digital avatars. So the whole idea of flow is to create trust that is balanced, transparent and secure enough to avoid manipulation false narratives, disinformation, identity theft, cybersecurity threats. And for some of us, our entire lives exist in the digital world, our finances, our social activity, our transcripts, even our behavioral traits. Whenever we go online, we leave behind a trail of data that corporations use to build our digital profiles and plug into AI algorithms that improve their services for us. And in all intents and purposes, we are, the, we are the training data for those digital tools that provide the feedback loop to reinforce our habits, our rituals, our behaviors. And you can see how you know, we produce data, the data then is taken and it feeds us and it becomes this loop. The more we engage in their experiences, the better they attempt to personalize our needs and retain our loyalty through targeted psychology. I love that, I love that piece. Um, you know, although this may seem just kind of just uber adventation, we also need to realize that our digital profiles are now complex enough really to build an accurate model of our real world behavior. You know, they are our real world selves in disguise that are wholly owned by corporations now. Um, you know, currently our profiles exist in legacy data formats that have changed very little beyond traditional identities like passports, IDs, and bank account numbers. But we envision being enriched with AI through data such as our social interactions, we have the potential to introduce cognitive capability into our digital profiles. So when we ask ourselves what a world looks like where we have the technology to curate our own lives, our own experiences, or have someone or something else do that like AI curated for us, we have to ask ourselves where are those boundaries in the exchange and how do we orientate ourselves in this reality? We each, each of us as humans, we have a unique way of looking at and relating to the world. So how do we or should we satisfy everyone's reality through devices where they can envision and activate a world just as they want it without impeding on someone else's reality? So with this type of flow, new types of data allocation and distribution platforms must be designed to provide value for the contributor and decentralize the way that we use AI. Now, this platform must inherit the best qualities of online experiences and efficient AI technologies, but must begin with the protocols, recommendations, references, and accountability for the biases which we may not even be aware of, which may be intended or unintended. 
So the individual designer should be orientated within with a, really a, a, a orientation around wisdom, diversity, and equity, you know, and really have that as the cornerstone of these algorithmic developments. And in order to really break down these constructs of disconnect, we as humans must take responsibility for learning how to orientate around broader perspectives of society, really engage in cross-cultural travel, conversations, and develop empathy for all parties that may be utilizing the device or software. So really getting back to that humanity aspect of what does it mean to be human, right? Even if it pushes us to our edges, we have to do that work. Leaning on the position paper, indigenous protocol and artificial intelligence really is a starting place for me, as well as I recommend it for others, for those who want to really design and create AI from an ethical position that really centers around indigenous concerns. Well, yes, thank you, Marcus. You know, especially talk, you're talking there about the intended and unintended consequences. And that's what people, also, in, in, especially in relation to biases, and that's sort of the bit that sometimes people forget. It's about the unintended consequences as well. And then bringing in the indigeneity around it. Brilliant. Um, so at the same time, when we begin to discuss what it could look like and break down these silos and hierarchies to create these centralized networks that are sovereign, we also have to be mindful of who has the power and the responsibility to decide what is balanced. Is it the government? Is it the institution? Is it the corporates, the community or the individual? Individual autonomy requires collective self-rule under democratic procedures, a collective rule that is able to supply the necessary collective public goods that can make the individual autonomous. For example, public safety and public health. Sovereignty is, is always an expression of political relationship between the ruler and the ruled, in the technological sense between the human and the technology. I love that out of that relationship, right, between the power structures. I think that's also so important when we're talking about digital sovereignty and trust. You know, and given that we live in societies that have thermodynamic properties driven by the interactions of the individuals within them, you know, the only true sovereignty that we envision for the future can really be realized in the digital space, where someone has the absolute freedom to create and live out their reality without imposing on someone else's reality. And with this, I see an influx of world building where science and art really dissolve into one another and fully solidify this imagination age that we're in. Now, this age is after the information age and is where creativity and imagination will become the primary creators of economic value, where essentially innovation for the future will be driven by people who can go beyond, by people who know how to really think beyond and think big, of, uh, you know, really go beyond and push the envelope around their current circumstances as well as their environment. And we need people with the ability to think beyond those circumstances in a way where world building presents a great opportunity to divine what the future actually looks like. So at the moment, world building in the digital space is really limited by this walled garden nature. There's only a few people that are really actively doing that. And you can only interact with someone's creation inside of the metaverse itself. But we can imagine these new forms becoming more easily shared outside of those confines, at which point they metamorphosize into true public discourse, making virtual worlds a way to really impact this real world, right? So as we begin to wrap up this discussion, I'd love to read a quote from Jaron Lanier, American computer philosophy writer, author of the book, Who Owns the Future? And he says, the foundational idea of humanistic computing is that provenance is valuable. Information is people in disguise. And people ought to be compensated for value they contribute that can be sent or stored on a digital network. So Ada, I'd love for you to continue to this discussion and really ground us in where we are and where we're going and what it looks like in the future. Thank you, Marcus. I love that quote. Information is people in disguise and people ought to be compensated for the value that they contribute that can be sent or stored on a digital network. Powerful. So as we ground our discussions, we have covered quite a bit and we've identified the old models which we have an opportunity to leave behind 
We've approached breathing in a new potentiality for a hypothesis for change for the digital future. We've considered how to grow in this new paradigm and have discussed what it could mean to flow in a boundless interconnected relationship between technology and human. And now as we move beyond the information age to, into the imagination age, we have a great opportunity to build new, equitable, considerate, secure, highly functional systems that take into consideration the creativity, empathy, functionality, compassionate diversity needed to build and realize this new world. That's beautiful. You know, and, and what we're talking about is really shifting, right? It's going from this information age where it's all about the data into this imagination age where it's really about this blending and this dynamic non-linear aspect, really um, kind of this, this quantum aspect of, of shifting, right? And I think the shift to more empowered collectives will lead to more tribal-based societies, you know, as the collective fully exerts their norms and values over their particular domain. So, you know, if we look at, you know, current times, um, full individual sovereignty is not possible as the individual is constricted to their own physical form, even with modifications. You know, a more realized individual sovereignty will likely only come from virtual worlds, where the individuals have complete control of, at minimum, their own avatar. Whereas any anarchic society will eventually reform order around a hierarchy of some sort. Right. So, however, a plethora of collective sovereignties while constricting the individual to their norms, paradoxically, you know, gives the individual more choice in comparison to the current nation state systems that we are currently living in. So for the individual can, term, can determine what fits his or her wants and needs. Now, this is different than the current system as the variety of governance structures, be it laws, customs, norms, et cetera, are quite similar between nation states. The choices between nation states is really minor. So we need to really revitalize our communities, including our educational communities, business communities, as well as our political communities, so that the principles of ecology become manifest in them as principles of education, management, as well as politics. Definitely. So we're coming to the end now, but I just wanted to share this with you. So in November 2019, I had the opportunity to be invited to host a series of roundtables for a council of 90 global Indigenous leaders at the World Indigenous Forum. Their aim was to help, them, the aim of this event was to help them start to write their collective manifesto. Indigenous peoples who have been systematically othered coming together to give their view of how we can and should co-design the futures that we need, especially if we are to save the planet. So they, those leaders, they see the time as now, but this pandemic has made space for the transformations that need to happen. We have a small window of opportunity for systemic change and to move from talk to action. Top of their list was the need for a new hierarchy of needs. And you've heard Marcus and I talk about it through this talk. What, but th what they were saying is that they, we need one that puts the needs of all inhabitants of the earth as our base fundamental need. They place great emphasis on the fact that we need to learn from the past, change our behavior in the present in order to have a future that we can design for. Now, technology has always been with us, albeit in perhaps less digital forms, but even those technologies made people question their capacity and ability to trust those with the power and rule, especially as they fought for sovereignty. The only difference now is that we talk about digital sovereignty. So in order to answer the question, what type of ancestor do you want to be? Marcus and I suggest that you revisit the past, acknowledge the present, so that we can co-design the futures of trust, transparency, and sovereignty for all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Wow, Marcus, Pata, thank you. Thank you. There was a lot. It was great. It was a lot. Um, and the chat was just extraordinary. And I think we could go on for um, days and days just diving deep. And thanks so much for all the different resources along the way. I think we'll try to um, coalesce those and bring them into the Slack channel. 
It is 11 o'clock and we've got a humanity break after all this discussion of humanity. If you need to take a break um, or if you decide to stand up and walk around a little bit, uh, there would be no judgment at all. Um, but that being said, I'd love to, to just have a few moments with you guys if you could stick around for a little bit. Yep. Yeah, we can do that. You are both wonderfully active in the chat. Um, so, and lots of questions happening there. I would encourage that to keep beginning. But I wonder if you have some reflections based on those conversations that we could pull into the moments we have together now. Um, I think one of the big things that came up for me and I saw it going through the chat as well, as well is, this, is this concept of language that we have to really understand and be really clear and define what we mean because everybody has a different idea of what technology is, of what we've mentioned, cyborg, shamanism. We mentioned so many new terms that everybody has a different starting point. And those starting points are based on our lived experiences, our, the, you know, the social circles, our education, all of those things. And so a starting point is always, you know, when we talk about our framework, a starting point is always start by making sure you understand each other, that you have a shared lexicon. So our framework that we taught you through, through this whole thing, which will help you kind of use that as a guide in some of the things that came up is that there's five phases. The first phase is leave. We all admit that there's a problem. We don't need to redefine the problem. We just know that there is, or there are several. So the first bit is leave. What, and then what are the value systems? What are the new values that you need to move away from those old models? The second is breed. What are the, um, what are the tensions in the system and how can we remove those tensions to create a new hypothesis for change? Language is about that. We talked about, you know, the relationship between our identities and ourselves and all of those. The third is grow. What are the tools, technologies, rituals, behaviors that are needed to try and make that true? Mm -hmm. And what are the MVPs? The fourth is flow. How do you make it sustainable? And, you know, we're not just talking about our generation or our children's generation or our children's children's generation, but, you know, this idea of long-term thinking, long now thinking. And a fifth is ground. Is, uh, ground. How do you ground it down and turn it more than just kinship? Because kinship, sorry, more than just citizenship, because citizenship is only about humans. We're talking about kinship to all life. And when you get to that point, you go back and you look at, are those values, do those values actually recognize, um, do they suit what you're doing? And I think the conversation that Marcus and I did brought that right through to that circle. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, um, that was a really good comment that really kind of piqued my interest. Um, I think it's Kalia, I hope I'm saying her name right. Um, and she stated, there is no technology fix for the human condition. Right. And that really brought it back home with what we were speaking about is that, you know, as a cyborg anthropologist, we really looked at there is no boundaries between humans and technology. Right. And then that extends to all living systems. So as we are creating these tools, we have to be mindful that humans right now are the training data for the tools that we are actually creating in the future. So we can have all of the, you know, most fancy blockchains and avatars and all of these different types of tools that we have access to. But if we don't work on the ego, right, the, the, mm -hmm. and, and actually updating the human operating system, mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult to actually, you know, create the tools and the conditions that we want to see for a more uh, digitally trustful uh, future. So I think that aspect of what we really touched on, Ada and I, was that there is no separation. There are no boundaries between humans and technology, that we are an agglomeration of the same thing. There's always been technology. Fire is a technology, right? That's how we use that tool will determine if we actually build or destroy. Just to echo with Marcus, but, you know, the found a starting from all of this is recognizing where our ego comes into this because it, that is you know it it's about the decisions that we make technology on its own can't do anything it's us that have the choices about how we interact with it you know how we use it and what we do with those insights and who we include right uh, if we're the training ground then the folks that aren't part of that aren't in the training grounds I'm not necessarily part of the human in the loops that you're describing that would help us to actually think through and, and frankly, see ourselves reflected in what we're creating and decide whether or not we like that reflection. And that's the reflection we would want to persist beyond when we're here. Yeah. That's uh, just extraordinary. And, you know, just to add to that, um, I know we're, we're tight on time, but, you know, there's this concept um, around the hierarchy of needs that Ada and I really, really push, mm -hmm. right? A lot of individuals, you know, we kind of work on the old adage of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where I need food, I need shelter, I need education. 
But really what we are doing is flipping that and looking at it more of an indigenous aspect, right? Where indigenous aspects, they looked at the relationality between themselves, uh, between their community members and then to the planet, right? Where that was at the top way to get to um, self-actualization was through the we rather than through the I. That was beautiful. I am so grateful to you both for being here. I just, uh, I really think this conversation has been amazing. Um, and I, I hope we can continue the conversation is there is a lot here to, to reform, to build that's quite new. Um, and it's, I think to some extent, um, it's the hidden acceleration. It's the places where that activity is happening and your um, experience of it isn't necessarily so cognizant of what's actually the building process underneath uh, where we all get to engage. And we you know, heard the hour before you um, some really extraordinary articulations from students who in a variety of ways are really engaged in this and they're very aware um, and actively having the conversation with their friends. Um, to add it to your point, they may not be using the same language that we're using, but we are forming that language um, and forming those cultural norms for how we even have the discussion um, and sessions like this. I'm so grateful that you guys are here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you to you, Donna, and thank you to the audience. Um, those questions of the chat were truly provocative. And I think it just goes to show that this conversation is needed and necessary. So thank you for hosting this. Absolutely. All right, everybody, we will let you take a quick break. Thanks so much. Have a lovely evening.